church. Um, I've been given uh, quite a chunk of passages to, to preach upon today. And as I looked at these passages, I realized it's not easy to give an overall message on the scripture here. Because within these passages, there's some very deep theological messages that God is revealing. If you remember two weeks ago, I preached on the, on the sermon called, uh, Are We Blind to Our Faith? And we looked at how we as Christians are presupposed and following what God tells us to do. Basically, we read the Bible and we use the Bible to justify what we want to do. Basically, we, we do what we want rather than what God instructs us or reveals to us. So today in this sermon, I'll be preaching along the same context. And we need to look at the passages within the same overall uh, message from the earlier uh, chapter. So today's sermon, I've titled it, In Who Do You Trust? As I said earlier, these passages um, contain some very important theological messages that reveals the divinity of Jesus Christ. And from verses 2 to 13, it talks quite a bit on the transfiguration, one of the very important events that happened in the Bible. And then it jumps directly to the next section, from verses 14 to 29, which talks about the healing of the young boy. We could preach numerous sermons on these passages, but there is a major overarching message when we look at the passages in full context from chapter 8 now into chapter 9. My brothers and sisters, Take a look at the world around us. In fact, we don't even have to look outside to the world and just look at what's happening within the church worldwide. There is so much division. There's so much rivalry. There's so much distrust. Many churches develop ideologies and attitudes that dispense hatred and animosity amongst each other. In fact, we allow our anger to overwhelm us, and we pursue paths, paths that only create disunity amongst us. No matter what the issues are, we are all mortal. We are all human. And more importantly, we are all sinful and broken people who do not allow the love of God to manifest over our mortal broken state. In fact, when we look at most churches today, they are no different than the secular corporate structures that exist outside. And we call ourselves Christians. My brothers and sisters, we as Christians and the church are supposed to stand up apart from the world. Unfortunately, we have created our own world within the church. Leaders do not, like, uh, each, do not like people who stand up for the gospel and cause division and isolation amongst these people. This is why in today's sermon, I pray that what Jesus says convicts our hearts that we as Christians must be conscious in our Christian walk. Hopefully, many of you here, after listening to the last sermon, to what Jesus has said in chapter 8, and we see here in chapter 9, opens with oh. Sorry. Okay, anyways, 
opens with in chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. What is Jesus talking about here? It seems a very strange statement that flows through from chapter 8. It seems a bit out of place, especially in regards to the beginning of chapter 9. I believe that this statement is directly related to the earlier passages in chapter 8 that where Jesus spoke. In fact, in chapter in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 38. And Jesus calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come to me after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. And what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be also ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. Do you remember what Jesus was talking about? He was talking about what we are willing to forfeit of this world to follow him. And if you remember in the earlier sermon in, on Mark chapter 8, where I talked about our spiritual blindness. And if we look further in verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. For my, for my sake. And the, will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. We see that Jesus is talking about losing our life for his sake. The question lies in whether we're willing to set aside this world, to die to this world and its corrupt influences on our lives. If we don't, then everything that Jesus has done will be second rated. To many of us, it only becomes a reference point. We use it only when we need it. Our predisposition and presuppositions will be our own dominant view in our Christian walk. God becomes secondary. And this is the problem of the church today. Leaders and Christians have set their own goals and conveniently placed God's word as a secondary support for their own goals. And this has also given rise to deviant teachings that are growing across the globe. Mormonism is a good example. And we know many, many cults are starting to pop up, like the oneness cults, or the Shin Cheonji Church of Jesus from Korea. They are very, very smart in promoting the ideologies. And if you talk to many of these people, and you see them a lot on the internet, that they approach naive Christians and present a glorious gospel. But if you know your scripture and you just have to ask them, do you believe in the Trinity? And that whole framework falls apart. If our desires are dominant in our spiritual need for perfection, then why do God have to send His Son, Jesus Christ? In fact, if that's the if if that is what we hold on to, you don't need God. You can do it all on your own, like many of these cults are doing today. Not only in deviant teaching, but in even in Christian Reformed churches, it's happening. The issues of immorality, the issue of constant 
perpetration of sin against the word of God. They hide it conveniently and then they deny it ever happened. And this is why Jesus says in chapter 9, verse 1, Truly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. What death is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about the death to self. If you see it that way, then the context of the rest of the passages, passages comes into very clear view of what Jesus is expounding. And when the kingdom of heaven comes, it will be too late to die to your own self and desires, our own wants, our own needs, and whatever we so cleverly deemed important in our lives rather than placing our faith in God. Jesus' last pronouncement is regarded as one of the most difficult statements of Jesus in the gospel, since it appears to predict that Jesus will return before the death of some of the 12 disciples and many of the people in the crowd. So how do we come to terms with this in what Jesus is saying to us? Let me put this in a very practical application. Many of us here are young parents and we have young children. And our goal as parents is to nurture and build good, strong, moral and ethical children. Children with character and spiritual strength. And as time goes on in these children's lives and you proceed to, to teach these children, but then, as, you, as time goes on, you begin to become lacking in your teaching. And before you know it, these young children that you have hoped and prayed for when they were born have grown up and have gone into the real world. Literally, you as parents have created the next generation of weak, moral, and unethical introverts that struggle with the world outside. And this is what exactly Jesus is talking about, that we are wasting our time of the world here, that when the kingdom comes, it's too late to die for anything except your condemnation. So what is Jesus telling us? What death are we supposed to taste? Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How are we to be born again? Only when we die to ourselves and our sinful nature, in our death, we see the clarity of the kingdom promised. This is so important because Jesus says, these people whose death comes will only, to see, will only see the kingdom of heaven after it has come. If the kingdom has come, it's too late. Even when we believe and follow it, according to what we presuppose in our Christian walk. And like the, in the early verse, we never place God first. God has become secondary in your life. And when the kingdom of God comes, this is what Jesus will say. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the king of, uh, kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I, the Lord, will declare to them, I never knew you. 
depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. My brothers and sisters, when we consider this, the next verses that follow here becomes into clarity, which is from verses 2 to 13, the transfiguration. In verse 2, we see that Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and led them out, led them up to the mountain. And these three individuals have a very distinct spiritual walk in the New Testament, if you read it, if you read their lives. James was martyred in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. Peter was martyred in Rome by the Emperor Nero. John was arrested in Ephesus and faced martyrdom when his enemies threw him into a huge basin of boiling water. But miraculously, he escaped. And he was sentenced to slave labor in Patmos. And on that island, God revealed to John the writings for the book of Revelation. John died an old man. All three of these individuals walked with Christ and knew Christ intimately. James was the first to be martyred. Peter struggled with his faith. And he carried his cross that was burdened by his own wisdom and reasoning but ultimately came to terms with his demons. John was delivered to die, but survived to an old age. Why is this important? Look at verse 7. And the cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. God the Father is speaking. Listen to my son. Don't listen to yourself. Not to what you perceive is right and wrong. What you think is the best. What you can do and hide from others. And it is interesting through this passages, we see that it was only Peter that spoke. James, was, who was martyred, was silent. John, who was to be martyred, was silent, survived and wrote the book of Revelations. John did as Jesus had inspired him to do and follow by writing the book of Revelations. My brothers and sisters, so I ask you here today, whose footsteps do you see yourself in now today? Is it James, Peter, or John? Or even Jesus? And those who say, Jesus, don't fool yourself. You cannot and will never be able to fill his shoes. As the passage continues, we see Jesus gives another instruction in verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And look what the disciples started talking about. What is this rising from the dead might mean? But they never spoke. In fact, they started to turn the subject on what they had seen in Elijah. And Jesus answered and gave a clear message that associated Elijah with the coming of the Son of Man suffering. And even after all that, we see that the author doesn't elaborate any further. And we, and we must ask this question to ourselves. 
did the three disciples understand? It's very obvious they did not. They were so confined with their own views that they missed the Davianic prophecy of the Son of Man. How many of us here are confined into our own views, our own worldview lens? Even as Christians, we set goals in our life and we pursue them wholeheartedly, proclaiming the will of God in your pursuit. And when confronted, we happily quote scripture. Do any of you realize how easy it is to take scripture to fit your own context, you know, your own pursuits? Proclaiming God's will, will in your actions. Here are some examples. Touch not mine, anointed in First Chronicles. And this is a favorite verse used by ministers who do, who do not like to be challenged. If my people who are called by my name in Second Chronicles, it's been used as a as a as to show your an instant revival in your Christian walk. Another very famous one: Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. I know many of you. I see a lot of smiles here amongst the ladies from Ephesians chapter five. <laughs> And this has been used by Christians as a final word of all marital disagreement. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Another good misuse of scripture. It's, used, it's been used to validate your divinity, your Godhead. And judge not a convenient way to repel any criticism against you, especially in the church. The reality is that scripture has been misused over and over again. Liberal activism has torn the church apart. Churches today are governed by factions whose ideology is built upon objectives that separate and divide God-fearing Christians. And I have been witness to such actions. Evil is manifesting its head in God's house. We worry about the world outside and we forget that the evil also lies inside. And this is why the apostles did not see. There was nobody around them to help them to see. But my brothers and sisters, we have no excuse today. We have the word of God as a testimony of our indifference. And this is why in the last passages where Jesus heals the boy of the unclean spirit, brings so much spiritual value to our Christian walk. We see clearly the difference between walking with God against walking ahead of God. And this leads me to the final, final section in verses 14 to 29, the healing of the young boy. From verses 14 to 29, we see the disciples were unable to cast the spirit out of a young boy, an evil spirit that made the boy mute, unable to speak. The same way the disciples around him were blind and mute. The same way many of us today are living Christian lives, blind and mute. We are blind and mute to the revelation of God's word, the testimony of the truths revealed in the Bible. And the disciples themselves who were witnesses to Jesus. And Jesus responds in verse 19, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? My brothers and sisters, Jesus is also talking to us today. He's asking us that same question. 
we happily confess and repent, but we continue to walk with our faith in God. We put our faith in ourselves. And our faith in God manifests itself only when we need Him. Otherwise, we, we are forever depending on our own works. Never trusting the Lord every living moment of our lives. Never confronting the evil and deceit around us and in us. And Jesus provides the key to our spiritual relationship with him in verse 23 and 24. If you can, all things are possible for the one who believed. And the man's child's father replied, I believe. Help, help my unbelief. How many of us has called out to God? If we think that we can walk the life of Christian faith without God, then the life, death, and resurrection of Christ means nothing to you. How many of us are willing to admit to our own shortfalls? How many of us are willing to seek God and His Word in our lives? Are we to be indwelled by the mute and deaf spirit of our own inherent sinful nature? The devil really doesn't have to do anything we are all presupposed by a broken and sinful nature. That is all that is enough to separate us from God. And as Jesus commands the Spirit in verse 25, and you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. My brothers and sisters, are we ready to hear that command and set aside our broken nature and accept Jesus as our guide in our lives? And see what happens to the boy in verse 26. And after crying out and convulsing him ter terribly, he came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said, he is Dead. The boy dies. My brothers and sisters, doesn't this verse sound familiar? But Jesus, in verse 27, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. This verse brings together the complete change of our lives to our whole inward nature, to be in Christ. And this is exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3. She, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul knew what it meant and how we must always seek God in our lives. It's not just a weekend thing when you come together and sing and rejoice. It's a 100% commitment to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. There's no halfway or quarter way or my way. The only way is when we seek God in everything that we do. And not only when we're depressed, lost, or fearful. Paul knew, and this, he, this is why he wrote in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has died and has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are made new, my brothers and sisters. We have died to our old and we are reborn. 
Many of us here have gone through difficult times in our lives. As Christians, we struggle with our walk, always asking God why. And it isn't an easy walk, I know. It isn't easy because the greatest hurdle is overcoming ourselves. And as we as individuals face challenges, or are inspired to do God's work. We must take a pause and ask ourselves if what we are doing is according to God's will. Is it something that we perceive as right? Or is it according to God? Are we acting according to what God wants us to do? Is it scriptural and supported very specifically by the word of God. And my brothers and sisters, lastly and most importantly, does it glorify God? My brothers and sisters in Christ, we see how in today's passages we can easily be drawn away from our Lord and Savior. As a church, we need unity. And the binding force of that unity is the love of God. Not our love, but the sacrificial love of God. We are called to sacrifice our own views, our own ideas, our own way of thinking, and put our trust in God. We must allow the love of God to manifest its presence in all of us. And there's no such thing as your personal dictation to your spiritual walk. It is what God has revealed. And this begins with your family, your spouse. That relationship that is bound together within the, the foundation of the, God, of the Bible and creation. All empowered by the love of God. And even when we do wrong, even when we have been insulted and despised upon, and even when you have, people have worked against you, even when to all who displace you for their own personal glories, we are called to love our enemy. How much can a person try to destroy when you manifest the love of God that's in with, within you. Don't allow churches to entice you with hidden agendas that are underlined by their own attempts of self-glory. There are churches out there whose whole goal is not for the glory of, a, of God, but their own self-glory. They hide sin. They do not want to proclaim the truth of the human condition. They preach and teach happy thoughts and blind people into their own self-righteousness, their own abilities, rather than proclaiming that our loving and graceful God has revealed the inability of our human state to be righteous and sanctified. We can fool ourselves. If you fool yourselves then you, that you are able, then you have never been saved. Churches can give you that false sense because the truth lies in the reality that we are unable. There is not one iota of our human nature and ability that will make us right in the eyes of God. It is God himself that does it for us. Through his son, Jesus Christ, we are saved in our repentance and we are made righteous. But the story is not over because unless we allow ourselves to be indwelled with the spirit of God, that we can live according to his will. Otherwise, our salvation from the beginning was set on condition that you yourself dictates. You were never saved. 
My brothers and sisters, how can we be humble and be assured of our Christian walk with God? And here is what Jesus offers in reply. This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. My brothers and sisters, it is prayer as individuals, as a paternal family in your home, amongst parents with their children. A journey of parents and their children starts from the minute that child is born to the day you have left to be with the Lord. It does not end. Every step of the way that you spend with your child molds him to the future that, he's, that he spends with the Lord. And if our commitment to our children falls short, then you fall short to what God has called us to do. And as a spiritual church family, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. It is Christ on the cross and his blood that brings us together as a family, that we share a central focus in our lives. Prayer brings that spiritual bonding amongst us. As a church family, we pray for each other. We pray for the church. We pray for our nation. We pray for our families. We pray for the world. Many of us ask ourselves, God already knows what you want. Why pray? Because God wants to hear your voice. God wants to hear your hearts call out to him. It's that intimate relationship that God seeks from every one of us. Why do I say that? Because God sent his son to die for you. Seek prayer amongst each other. Seek prayer amongst your church leaders to pray for your, for your needs. It is to remind us that God is in our lives every day, that we can be spiritually awake and walking with our Lord rather than walking ahead of Him. That our blinds are taken off and our coverings of, and then we begin to hear that it's the voice of the Lord that leads us and guides us in every step of our Christian walk. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word. We give thanks for the wisdom proclaimed in your word. Father, I pray that today amongst my family here and your family of your of my brothers and sisters, that the word that has gone through their ears and what they have seen is brought into the hearts to convict them. To the knowledge that the lives they live as individuals, as committed parents, as faithful church goers, and more importantly as faithful Christians. That our lives are governed by your word that leads us and guides us and moves us ultimately for the glory of your name. That we become the examples and the empty vessels upon which your lights can shine through. That it brings comfort to those around us. It brings peace and understanding and love. Father, guide us, lead us. We accept the, our mortal state of being unable and realize that only through you that we are made able. We ask this through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks.
may I invite all of you all to stand as we sing the response song. So in response to the message, we will be singing the song, The Goodness of Jesus. Uh, and I like to, and I hope that through this song, we can remind ourselves how much we need God um, and that we'll be able to abide in Him, that through His guidance, we'll be able to uh, produce fruit. <laughs> 